my name is Ellen and I serve here at Grace Life. Here's what's coming up in the life of our church. If you're wanting to get more connected, grow and share life with others in the Grace Life community, one of the best ways we can do this is through our life groups. If, you're, if you are not currently part of a life group, please see the front desk or email below. Take some bread from both of our campuses and share with others in need. The timing and locations are on the screen. Spread the word about our low cost emergency food. Maybe you're part of a Facebook group that could use this information. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Make sure to note your expression of interest for the women's event in Manjo this August. For more info and to RSVP, the details will be on the screen. And the last day to RSVP will be the 25th of July. Hey Grace Life Men, I want to encourage you to note down the date of August 21st for a special breakfast. We have a special guest coming, Graham Mabry. You, some of you might know him as the presenter of 6BR and he had been for 33 years and also he was the one who established Lifeline WA. And so we want to encourage you to make sure you note that date down. It's going to be breakfast not to be missed. RSVP as soon as you can at the information desk. Both our campuses, we want to invite you to join one of our serving teams in Grace Life. Whether it's a Sunday team or any team throughout the week, you're welcome to join. Just feel free to speak to your campus pastor or anybody serving in one of these teams. Serving is one of the ways we grow in discipleship to Jesus. And so this is an open invite to all who would like to be part of that. And hey, if you have been thinking about joining a team, another opportunity for you to get involved is to come and join us for our team night on July 11th. And I want to encourage you to come along. It's from 5 p.m. RSVPs are on your screen. We can't wait to be there together. Join with us as we continue to contribute to the Grace Life family through the joy of giving. If you would like to give, there are many ways to do this, including text to give, FPOS, and the giving boxes at the back of the building. Thank you for your generosity. Stick around after the service for a chat and don't forget to be observing social distancing guidelines where you can. We are about to hear a message from one of our speakers. I want to encourage you to be anticipating that God wants to speak to you through our message today. So get ready to engage with the message and hear what God has to say to you. Now then, I've, you've all got, or, or maybe you, you haven't all got, but you've all got a set of notes that I put together. And I've, I've printed them out for all of you because I wanted you to have this copy. Uh, on the back of it, it's got uh, some lines you can do your notes. And this is in the lead up to Pastor Josh's series on the Art Gallery of Faith, Hebrews 11. And, um, and I just put these notes together on Monday. You know that Margaret's had a, a broken arm. And I've been the head cook and bottle washer. And I found out that a woman's work is never done. There's always things to do. Oh, I've got to make the jellies for tonight. I've got to get the, what, what are we having for dinner tonight? What are we, and, I, and all this shopping you have to do. Oh, it's a pain in the neck, all this stuff. And you ladies, you do this all your lives. And all I'm, you know, I've been sat in my chair watching... Uh, bargain hunt after I've had my dinner and I'm thinking what's she messing about at in that kitchen for and then and then now she's saying what are you messing about in that kitchen for <laughs> and so it's only this Monday that I've really got back into the word I, what, what I have I have a little system of uh, every day I'm I've started going through the gospels and and I've gone through Matthew and I'm into Mark now and it's chapter 6 that you've got the notes about. Because on Monday, I thought, I've got to get in. And what I do, I read a chapter, and then I say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to show me uh, in, in my life and in my season where I'm in now? What, what is it you want to say to me? 
And then something comes to me, something, you know, in that chapter. And then I start writing it out on, on all my scrap bits of paper. I've got loads of A5 bits of paper. And I write it all out. And then on Monday, I got to Mark 6. Oh, and this really got hold of me, I thought. And I'm going to read it from verse, uh, this is from verses 7 to verse 13. It's actually where, where the disciples had been with Jesus to his hometown. And he, he could do no mighty work there except to heal a few sick folk because of their unbelief. He marveled at their unbelief and their hardness of heart. And, uh, and then he, he comes and, and they, they leave they leave and they, they start getting on, uh, going around the villages. And, and, and he says here, and he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And he commanded them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money bags, sorry, money belts, but to, wear sand, uh, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, just shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day, uh, sorry, in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And that was the bit that got me, that grabbed me, you see. And, and especially then, Pastor Josh calls me on Tuesday morning. And I, I typed all these notes out that you have by then. I, it, it so got hold of me. It just wasn't my handwritten. I'd gone, and Margaret said, hey, can I have a copy of those notes? So she got a copy. And, uh, and then Josh rings me on Tuesday morning. Hey, Bishop, he says, do you think you could preach for us on Sunday morning? Something about faith. Something about miracles. And I'd entitle this, this uh, Believing God for miracles and signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Again, this is, and you must understand, these notes you have are really for me, it's God speaking to me what I've got to do. And I've just printed them out for you. And I've, I've just kind of gone to this passage because Pastor Josh said, tell them some of your stories about what God's done in your life. And, um, <laughs> you know, and he's, he's so encouraging like this. So I'm thinking about, and I started to put together. I thought, right. Um, and then as I'm looking at this chapter, I see that it falls into three areas of faith. Number one is faith to activate your calling. Um, everything, that we, everything that we have and everything that we do in the kingdom of God. It's all by faith. We, we, we've no way of knowing in actual fact how things are actually going to turn out. We just believe and we just trust. You know, like we, we used to sing years ago, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And that's really what Margaret and I have done through the seasons of our life. We've just trusted him, and by the grace of God, try to obey. And maybe sometimes not always as hurriedly as we should have done, but by and large, we've sought to obey what the Lord has asked us to do. I notice in this chapter that, the, that Jesus commanded them on some occasions to do something. Then he called them to do, uh, to be something on other occasions. And, and then he just spoke to them and asked them and told them. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different ways the Lord speaks to us. And so, 
uh, here, here I am this morning, and I'm just going to read to you, um, uh, just before we get into the three, the three points, this is, this is the introduction you've got in your notes that I wrote down for myself. And I'm going to read it because it kind of gives the background. You'll catch some of my spirit of where I'm at. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're coming to church this morning and I'm saying, here we are, an 84-year-old and an 82-year-old, still driving to church, still wanting to get We would have been here earlier, by the way. I mean, previously, but apart from, we were all ready to come four weeks ago. And, and uh, you know, with Margaret, with arm was in the sling, et cetera. But, and then COVID comes, and then this, and then that, and here we are. Uh, but here we are, 84 and 82. And we've got kind of a little bit reflective in our lives <laughs> in this season of our life. You know, we sit down together, have a cup of tea in the morning, and, and we say, wow, surely goodness and mercy <laughs> has followed us all the days of our lives. And we reflect on, on you know, I, I know, you know, when, when it's a sign of old age when you start going down memory lane, you know. You, <laughs> and God help me, I don't just want to live on what has been in the past. I want to live on what's going on now in my life. What's God saying to me now? What does he want me to do now? I know you say, oh, well, you've got bad knees and you've got to sit down a lot. Who cares? Let's get going and do something. And, and you'll see some, you know, right at the very end of your notes uh, is, is the, the, the seven things God said that I've got to do. This is for me personally. And I've put the lines on the back with notes for you to maybe over this series of, the, uh, of, of Hebrews 11 and speaking of faith and challenging us to believe God, for you to write down what's God telling you to do, what's God asking you to do. And, and, and make a note of it. And I, as I say, I, w- I, was, I was writing that down some of the things uh, of, uh, of the, all the stories on, just on a bit of scrap paper. I, 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 and I've got four pages of miracles and signs and wonders that God has done for us over the years. And, um, and you know, we're very... Well, we keep saying this, Margaret, we are so blessed. Uh, He's blessed us in our basket and in our store. He's blessed us in our going out and our coming in, Deuteronomy 28. He's blessed us in in the city. He's blessed us in the field. He's blessed us in the fruit of, I was going to say, our womb, her womb. He's blessed us in the fruit of her womb. (laughs) Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I just had a little part in it. That was all, you know. Um, uh, so here's what I wrote. As I've been reading Mark's gospel again, I've been struck by the power and authority with which the disciples operated after they had been called, commissioned, and empowered by Jesus in Mark 6 and verse 7 that we've just read. And then seemingly... Without any hesitation, they went out and preached. It just says, and they went out. Now, I know Mark's gospel is written in a very immediate kind of uh, setting. You'll find out when you read Mark's gospel, and immediately they did this, and immediately, he's a, he's a real activist, is Mark, you know. Immediately they did this, it's a very fast-moving gospel, is Mark. And, uh, uh, but they, but they, they, they just, without any hesitation or equivocation, they just got on with it and did it and went out. And so, so when it comes to seeing miracles and signs and wonders take place in my present season of life and ministry, I need to be less focused on myself and more sensitive to the needs of others and like Jesus, have some compassion for those who are in any kind of need. I, I'm... I can be a bit kind of dismissive sometimes. You know, I don't want to be bothered. Um, like my neighbor came in the other day, and I, I, really, I really remembered this because he's got a speech impediment. It takes him half an hour to say three words, you know. 
and I know what he's going to say, and I want to say it for him, and I want to get in ahead of time, and he, he frustrates me sometimes, but you know, on Monday, after reading this, <laughs> and putting this, I was so nice to him, and I was so, and I really count, oh, and I really spoke into his life, oh, it was really wonderful. Anyway, therefore, if I'm going to minister life and health to those who I come in contact with, I need to take a page out of the disciples' book and seek to imitate what they did and how they responded as a result of being called and commissioned and empowered by Jesus. So here's me now reading this. Right, Lord, what can I take from this that is for me? I want to take a page out of their book. And, oh, excuse me, in your notes, the different to what I'm just going to speak on now. I'm just going to speak on three things. Number one, faith to activate your calling. Number two, faith for supernatural provision. And number three, faith for signs to follow the preaching of your word or, you know, your ministry or whatever it is that, that you do. Now, those are the three ways I'm going. I don't know how long I've been going up to now, but I've... Anyway, but I'll just keep going and then... Look, I'm never going to get... You're going to have to say time out or something and to tell me when I've finished. I, Josh, said 30, Josh said 35 minutes. I don't know what... It, it says 2128 there. I don't know what that means. Is it the date or something? Uh, oh, is that what I've got left? Oh, right. Oh, oh right. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Right, here we go then. Number one. Well... So they had, to, uh, uh, they had to have faith, number one, to activate their calling. I put your calling. Because, you see, God is still speaking to all of us day by day, day by day. What's he calling? What's he asking? What's he speaking to you about? What, whatever it is, as you go through this series over the next few weeks in the Art Gallery of Faith, Bring your notes with you. Bring a piece of paper. Be open to what the Spirit of God is saying uh, so that he can speak to you. You see, um, you know, Margaret and I were missionaries in, in, uh, in Asia, in Malaysia and, and Indonesia and Singapore and, and uh, around there. And uh, we served God there. And I, I felt God calling, calling me to be a missionary to India. That's what I felt when I was, you know, we, Margaret and I went to a little church called the Philadelphia Tabernacle. Everybody where we lived thought it was from America. And they didn't realize that there was a church in Philadelphia. And Pastor Jones gave us that name, gave it this, this pioneer church that name because it was the church where, that God found nothing wrong with in Revelation. <laughs> And he, he was saying, uh, after having a church, there was, there was nothing wrong with it. And great brotherly love there. And so we, we served God as Sunday school teachers and, and, uh, for, for 11 years in that place, from, from being 18 to 20, oh, so, uh, eight, no, 10 years, 18 to 28. Oh, no, that was when I got married, wasn't it? Yeah. 18 to 30, 12 years, that's right. Then we actually went to Malaysia as missionaries. But when we started courting, I went round to Margaret's house. And she, you, many of you know that Margaret is my best friend's sister. But I never let her know that I liked her. I was too spiritual for that. I'm going to be like John the Baptist, you know, because... If you're going to be a missionary, you can't be having kids and all that kind of thing and, and getting married and carting kids around the world. They cost money. And so you've got to be economical. And so, anyway, this was me. But when we started courting, the very day I asked her to go out with me, we went out a walk up the lanes, hand in hand. And I said to her, I feel God's calling me to India. Would you be prepared to come to go to India, if, you know, if we... Well, when I, when I proposed to her, I actually, on that same day, said, will you go out with me with a view to getting married one day? Not, uh, not can I take you out for a dinner tonight? Not, 
not can we just <laughs> you know go and meet not some roses I'm, I'm i'm so spiritual never mind all the roses and flowers and all this stuff let's get to the point you know oh no will you go out with me with a view to getting married in the name of the lord for fortunately she said yes but and she agreed that she however it didn't work out that way and we never got to india but we did get to malaysia and it was that call that motivated us to to do stuff and this is as as part of our in this album i've got different headings like this this one says our call to missionary service. And all of our kids have got these pages that have got our... I'll just take this clip off. And I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just show you just like this. There, there's some friends of ours seeing it off. And in the middle, there's a picture of a five-pound note. That was all we had when we left England to go and be serve God in, in, in Malaysia. We were going on a cargo ship from Rotterdam. We had to go from, from London to Rotterdam and then get on this ship. And I won't go into all that story, because, but we had a five-pound note, no guarantee support, no credit card. Well, credit cards weren't even invented when we, when we went to Malaysia. And that was all we had. And, uh, and I remember writing, and here's... Here I am when I was really young. And here's Margaret. And this letter here is the letter I wrote to the missionary council asking them about being a missionary. And this was written on October the 18th, 1962. And this is a copy of the actual letter that they wrote back to me saying, if you feel that you want to proceed with this, then apply to the missions council, which we did. And eventually, we did go to Malaysia, got on a boat with five pound and, and, and got married. And uh, Well, we got married before we got on the boat, I mean. Uh, uh, but, and, and when I think of it now, I mean, I, I won't go in. I've got my credit card in my pocket now. I won't go anywhere without my credit card. But we went with just a five pound note, and we'd not even spent it by the time we got to Singapore. It was still in my wallet, the five pound note, because you got all your food and everything on the boat, and it was all given to you. And people picked us up in Singapore and took us to Malaysia, and, then they, and looked after us and take, took care of us, and we still didn't have any more money than that five pound note. And when I think of it now, I think we must have been daft. You know, to think that. But you see, sorry? It must have been faith, yeah. Hey, and praise God, I had a lovely girl who believed in me enough to come and do it. You know, because when we went, when we went, we had Angela, one. When we came back three years later, we'd got four. We'd been multiplying and replenishing the earth. <laughs> I tell you. And those kids that I didn't want, somehow or other, came along, four of them. And we had to look, well, I say, and this is why I honor this lady, because she's carted four children around the world with very limited resource, having to, and I think it's harder for women, because, you know, they, they, where are they going to get the food from to feed the family? You know, they're thinking of those things, whereas men just think, oh, it, you know, God will provide, or it'll all work out. <laughs> Well, it does, but it takes a bit of sacrifice on somebody's part for it to happen. And it may be that's what God is calling you this morning. Maybe there's, there's got to come somewhere, uh, some, another level of trust. I know we have, we have all on, I mean, now, I mean, we're so well off. We've just had our house valued at 370000 and uh, because our kids want us to go in a retirement home. And so we went to see the retirement village and we weren't all that crash out about it, you know. <laughs> you know, and they've got a ball, they've got a bowling green and they've got this and they've got that and they've got the other. But who wants 
And then you've got to pay them 30% of the value of your house when you leave. $74,000 I'd have to give them if I lived there six years. Oh, I'm not having that. No way. I, I want my kids to have $58,000 each when I die at this present rate of now. And my grandkids should have 10 grand each when we go to be with Jesus. Anyway, I'm, I'm 12 minutes 48 left. <laughs> oh, okay, number two. Number two, you've got the message there. Faith for supernatural provision. Now, obviously, with that five-pound note, you... But, you know, as time went on, I got... Uh, uh, because of our missionary connections with American Assemblies of God missionaries in Malaysia, when we came back to the UK and they went back to America, one of them, Jim Jones, who was a great friend of ours, became a professor of, uh, in one of the colleges, a Southeastern Bible College. And he was a professor of missions. And, and he invited me to go and be the preacher at their five-day spiritual emphasis week and missions week in Florida. In, in, and, uh, oh, I was so excited about going, but I didn't have any money to go. <laughs> I didn't even have the money for any airfare or anything. And I, was, uh, I needed God to somehow help me. And so I... In our home at that time, by the way, we've had three homes supernaturally, four homes supernaturally provided for us in incredible ways. And again, I can't go in. I'm a bit like Paul in Hebrews 11. He says, he says and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of this and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David and of the prophets. But he didn't have time in Hebrews 11. He had to stop. And I've got to get on with the story. But the thing was, I, I had a little office that I'd put up in the loft of the house. I, because of the four kids down below who were all young, I had a ladder that went up in the loft. And I pulled my ladder up so they couldn't follow me. Uh, and so I had this little office in the loft. And then I put the trap door back down. And that was it. You know, I, I was in the secret place. <laughs> Dwelling in the secret place overshadowed by his grace, looking up into his face. <laughs> and I went up and I said, Lord, you have to speak to me about how am I going to get the airfare for this trip to America. So I thought, well, I did something you're not supposed to do. I opened my Bible and I went, And then I kind of, no. <laughs> no, I opened it. Well, I'm joking. With it, but I, and I went like that. And I opened my eyes. And it says, take no thought what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall put on. For your heavenly Father knows your need. It was like a sign, you know, miracles and wonders and signs. I, I was so excited as if I'd got the money, but I had a telephone extension put in my office. And just as I'd got this scripture, I, I mean, I marvel at it now. How, 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 my knees are hurting me, I'm sitting down, taking taking too long to tell this story. but the, I no sooner put my finger on that text in Luke, the phone rang, and a friend of ours on the other side of the country, hi, Bob, how are you going? I was saying, uh, my grandmother's died and left me some money, and I want to send you some. How much would you, do you want? <laughs> I felt like telling him how much I want. But I'd already read, my heavenly father knows what I need. And I said, Pete, I'm sorry. I'd love to tell you what, I, what I, I need. But my heavenly father knows. He said, okay, I'm putting the check in for 500 pound in the post. That paid my airfare to Florida and got me there. 
but then I had to go. And I had, a, I had an old cardboard suitcase. You know, these old, well, you young people won't even know about cardboard. You're, you're all trolley things, you know, that, that all go along like this. No, th this was just a, a brown cardboard suitcase that we brought back from Malaysia with us, and it was bad. And so what I did, I thought, I, I can't go to America with this. I painted it black. So that it looked nice. I put two yellow stripes on it as well to make it look like a pinch. Oh, really design a label on this, this cardboard case. And all I had to go to Florida was an Irish tweed suit and a, and a blazer and a pair of grey flannels. That was it, you know, and, you know, a couple of shirts and a few, few pair of jocks as well, you know, I mean, all the other stuff. And I go to Florida... And I'm on the platform, and I'm, I'm the, the speaker for all the sessions of the, you know, every morning, every afternoon, every evening. For five days, I'm, I'm sharing about, you know, God and Jesus and the Bible. And I'm turning up in Florida with an Irish tweed suit on, on the platform. One day, this pastor who's on the platform, I'm sat next to him. He says, are you free to come out for lunch today, Bob? Um, I'd like to take you out for lunch. And I said, oh, that's very nice. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, and they, they put me in a hotel as well, you know. Oh, I, they really looked after me. Not to mention the fact they gave me $2,000 offering when I left. Oh, I thought, I'm coming here again. You know? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, $2,000. Mean, nobody would ever give me that. Anyway, that, coming back to the story. So this, he takes me out, and then we're, we're having, he said, look, I want to take you to my outfitter uh, to get you fixed up with a couple of outfits. So he took me to his outfitter. I got a brand new suit, silk shirt, two ties, shoes, yellow socks, and, and then another sports coat, another pair, two pair of trousers to match the stuff, and, and two shirts, and, and everything else to go with it. Wow, because all these preachers in America, they were all turning up in different suits every meeting. And here's me still in my Irish tweed suit and, and, and my flannels. And, my, and, you know, I look really poor, not to mention my suitcase when they took it off the plane. And, and, and it's a, oh. he's a... He's an English missionary. They're not very well off in England. <laughs> they live by faith. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> anyway, it's funny, but Jim, Jim Jones, after I finished the conference in the week, he said, I'm preaching at this church on Sunday, but I, I don't feel I ought to go. You go in my place. I said, you can't do that, Jim. Just say, Oh, he said, they, well, they'd love you. Everybody in America likes English accents. <laughs> and and, and you know, he was quite dismissed. No, you go. I, 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 fine, just go. I got a Greyhound bus that drove right through the night to go to this church. And this pastor picked me up. And I'm only telling you this because we, we stayed for ages and they came and visited us England later on. But he took me out and bought me a brand new Samsonite suitcase and a matching briefcase instead of a brown paper bag that I had to put my, to put my Bible in. Oh, and then... Because I got this love offering, I went shopping before I came home to get something for Margaret. I wanted to get a... I'm a bit embarrassed to say, but, you know, like a, a flimsy kind of night. Kind of. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> Too much absence makes it wonder. <laughs> and I go to this store, you know, and I bought, I wanted to get her an outfit. I got her a lovely suit, and then I'm in this kind of negligee area, you know, with all this frilly stuff. And the lady comes and says, Can I help you? And I said, Well, I'm looking for something nice for my wife, you know. And so she said, well, uh, What size is she? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> So she said, well, look around at some of these ladies. 
you know, what, what does any one of them look more or less like? Oh, yeah, she's about that size, that woman there, you know. And so I got this lovely thing and this thing, and I had it in my case, came home to London. But my friend at London picked me up so I could drive back up to north the next day. I put me up at his house. They had to put you up bed in their lounge. I opened my case, <laughs> and there's this beautiful, Pink, frilly thing. And Martin says to Colin, you never buy me anything like that, Colin. <laughs> oh, oh, anyway, point number, you've got the idea about supernatural provision. And when you've done it and you've seen how God operates, you're spoilt for life. You're spoilt for life. Because we've seen it over and over. Not because we've gone around telling everybody. Not because we, no, we've put, you know, I, you know, I, I put, my, you know, I'm, I'm the bee's knees when I go anywhere. You know, I'm the, I'm the king of the castle. I don't give any impression that we're in need or anything like that. Oh, anyway, one minute, 51 seconds left. Right. <laughs> right. Number three. Here it is. Yeah, number three, where are we? Oh, we're not in Luke anymore, are we? No worry. Here it is, number three. Number three is for the signs and wonders. Faith for signs and wonders, or signs following the preaching of his word. Now, would you just give me just five minutes just to tell this story? And then we fin- I honestly, we will finish. Because Josh will kill me if he knows I've gone, I've gone over time. <clears throat> when, when we couldn't get back to Malaysia as missionaries, this is this, this is going on now, because there was a, a, a government policy that wanted Malaysian citizens to be in the jobs that missionaries had. So, but I went back as a missionary evangelist, and this pioneer pastor asked me to go. To, to his church and do three days of meetings. This is in a little town called Tankak in Malaysia. And it's only a little place and you wouldn't even notice it. You drive through it in, in less than five minutes. But I go and I'm, I'm going there and I'm going to... And, and it's, it just has it in an upstairs little room. And when they come at night, there's about, what, not even 20 people in the meeting. But they're from the rubber estates, and there's Chinese, there's Malay speaking, and there's Indian people as well. And he's got two interpreters to interpret my message. So a 15-minute message takes 45 minutes, you know. With you know, so I, um, I start preaching, you know, and you know, not, you can see how I like a bit of atmosphere, can't you? You know, I, I, I need to have a bit of flow. When you're doing an in, within, you know, well, it's great to be here tonight and, and we believe in God for signs and wonders to follow the preaching. And, and so, I want you to turn to my... Oh, it's a pain in the neck, you know. I'm thinking, what's happening here? There's nothing going to happen here. It's as dead as a dodo. I felt as dead as a dodo. But we invite people to come for prayer. And about five people come out. And so we start to pray for them. And this guy is deaf and dumb. He's a deaf mute. And the pastor tells me he's a... So I think, well, I, I, when I don't know what to do, I shout louder. So I'm really shouting this prayer. And Jesus, you know, but in my heart of hearts, I must be honest, I didn't have a lot of faith for this. I must be honest. And anyway, I finished praying and he he looks at me as if say a, a little bit, you know, I can, and he gets my hands and puts them on his head again. And pray again, you know, I didn't say that, but that was the so I prayed again. When I prayed the next time, his ears were open and he could hear. Oh, it was a supernatural thing. A sign and a wonder. 
even when I didn't really believe it was going to happen. Because God works irrespective of me. And then, you know, what about that man that came to Jesus? He said, I believe, but will you help my unbelief? Jesus didn't say, oh, you've got no faith, clear off, you know, I'm not interested in you. I only want people who know how to believe. No, he still got what he was believing for, even though he said, I do believe, but will you help my unbelief? I'm sorry about it. And I was a bit like that. Not only did he get healed, oh, it, it went through the village and the town, you know. Next night, he brought his deaf and dumb mate with him. And he got healed as well. Oh, yeah. And I share that because that was one of the most outstanding supernatural signs and wonders that I've ever seen God do in my life. And what God told me to do tonight, tonight, <laughs> show you how long I've been preaching, I think it's night time. Uh, <laughs> and I'm only minus two, do two, two dollars. <laughs> I'm only minus two, two minutes, 55 cents behind, so I'm finishing now, but... Here's the three questions that I just want to finish with. This is my anointing bottle. Because God told me when I was reading this on Monday, last Monday, I've got to anoint people with oil when I pray for them. So I brought my anointing oil bottle. Because then maybe some of you may want to come and get anointed. Now, I can't pray for every one of you, man. My knees wouldn't, you know. But if you want me to anoint you, I can come just, if you just come and stand here, I'll come down and I'll just anoint you. Then I'll sit down and I'll pray for everybody because there might be different needs. You know, it might not even be your need. Maybe you want to come for some relative or some friend. You want to have faith for them, for some intervention, for some provision maybe, some supernatural provision that you're looking for or, 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 or whatever Whatever it might be, uh, I just wrote, I, I've got to ask you these three questions because I wrote them down and I thought this was what I ought to say. Do you need to activate a calling of God on your life? You know, maybe God's spoken to you about doing something, about serving him. You know, maybe in the kids' ministry, maybe volunteering, maybe doing it, and God's spoken to you. I accept, you know, I, I, was, I was 12 years in Philadelphia Tabernacle telling kids stories every Tuesday night and Sunday school teaching and youth meetings and cleaning meetings and all the rest of it for 12 years before, before it ever became, you know, going as a missionary or public or anything like that. But the call came while I was doing something. And it's when you're active that God speaks. Start doing something and then God opens doors and, and things begin to happen. Number two, do you need to believe for some miraculous provision today? Or do you know somebody? And number three, do you, like me, need to believe for those miracles and signs and wonders to follow you again? We hope and pray that you were blessed by that message today. If you have any questions or prayer requests, please feel free to contact us by the email below.